Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our final press conference today. Uh, my name is Barbara Freire, I'm the Geo Media and Communications Manager, and I would like to remind you that we will open the floor for questions from the journalists here in the room following short presentations from our speakers. This press conference is on new hazards research, Anak Krakatau, Glacial Lakes and Giant Quakes. And taking part in this media briefing, we have David uh, Tappan, who is a marine geologist at the British Geological Survey in Nottingham in the UK. Alvaro Gonzalez was a postdoctoral researcher at the, with the Complex Systems Group, the Centre de Recherza Matemática in Bella Terra, Barcelona, in Spain. And then finally, we have Simon Allen, who is a researcher at the Department of Geography at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. I'll hand over to you, David. Thank you, Barbara, and thanks everyone for coming this afternoon. And I'm going to kick off uh, this press conference uh, describing the Anna Krakatoa eruption tsunami of December 2018, sharing some of the ideas that we developed over why this happened, and then why this event is, is very important as far as uh, tsunamis and tsunami generation and hazard is con it, it's concerned. Uh, what actually happened uh, on December the 22nd, quite late in the evening, uh, Anna Krakatoa is located in the Sunda Strait uh, in Indonesia, uh, there was a flank collapse of the volcano here, and the collapse into the water generated a tsunami. And the tsunami flooded outwards towards the coast of southern Sumatra and western Java, and uh, it killed 437 people, uh, 13,000 were injured, and many, many more displaced. And one of the aspects of this tsunami was there was no warning system. So these people were exposed to this without any idea of what actually was um, happening. Why the collapse? It's a volcano. It had been erupting since June. It was fairly quiescent. There was no indication of what would happen on the evening of December the 22nd. Uh, on that, that time, at about uh, 7 o'clock at night, there was an intensity of, of the eruption. It decreased. And this, we think, triggered the landslide, which collapsed into the, the water. And the reason for this was its particular location. It was on the edge of quite a deep uh, trough within the, uh, in, in the caldera. And the slide slipped into this. And uh, by that means, it generated the... the, uh, the tsunami. Uh, the context of this particular tsunami is over the past 20 years, uh, there have been a number of major, major, if not catastrophic events. Most of you will be very familiar with these. Uh, three of these, uh, which uh, uh, were very, very serious, was Papua New Guinea in 1998, and then, of course, the Indian Ocean in 2004, and, of course, Japan. Uh, Japan and Indian Ocean were generated by earthquakes. Papua New Guinea was generated by a submarine landslides. So over the past 20 years, we've really increased our knowledge of the generation mechanisms for landslides and, and earthquakes. We know that volcanic collapses generate tsunamis, and uh, an event which has been discussed and has been controversial has been in the Canary Islands and the term mega tsunamis, you probably all are actually aware of. We also know about volcanic eruptions, and in the same location, of Anna Krakatoa in 1883, the big the volcano of Krakatoa itself erupted. But this was a long, long time ago, and that's one of the aspects of the development of modern tsunami science. Why is Anna Krakatoa important? Because it's the first event we've been able to investigate using all the modern technologies and understandings that really have come about over the past 20 years. Uh, numerical tsunami modelling, particularly from non-seismic sources, uh, satellite radar, high-resolution satellite photography of before and after the event, and high-resolution seabed mapping. And what we're looking at here is this uh, before and after. Uh, the eruption, August the 20th, Anna Krakatoa is, 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 uh, hadn't uh, been disturbed. And then, of course, on, on December the 20, 24th. And on the right hand, or 22nd, on the right hand side here, uh, an image of the tsunami which was actually triggered by that uh, collapse. So for the first time ever, we've actually had all these technologies available to us to actually better understand what actually, uh, what actually happened. And uh, the ramifications of this are the warning systems. Warning systems in all the world's oceans are, are predicated upon large, Earthquakes, we call them mega, 
mega earthquakes. Uh, volcanoes are still little, little understood. We know that they collapse, but there have been no recent events. So Anna Krakatoa has, is really important because suddenly we have an event we can study. But, but, but also uh, within Indonesia, there was an event in Sulawesi uh, about three months earlier. And both these events were not large magnitude earthquakes. And this is very, very significant because there's no warning for, for, these, for these events. So a major challenge that we have, which was existing before December, was in how we mitigate against non-seismic sources. And with Anna Krakatoa, we have a really good opportunity to actually better understand these in, in the context of, uh, of, of warning. Uh, previous events uh, we have studied Indian Ocean and Japan particularly, the result of these was a major improvement in mitigation. We now have warning systems in all the world's oceans. But sadly, these events have only, these uh, developments have only been developed because of the number of people who died. And uh, tsunamis over the past 20 years have been over 250,000 people, probably one of the most significant uh, hazards. Uh, ge ge geological um, and hazards. There have been previous eruption. I've mentioned Krakatoa, but that was a long, long time ago. Uh, Anna Krakatoa identifies the hazard right now. And as I've mentioned, these previous events we've seen in the past 20 years have had major, major con consequences. Sometimes we get it right. And actually, with Anna Krakatoa, we had a project looking at the event of 1883. And because we had this team in place, it immediately happened. We actually started working on it uh, immediately because we were been working on the 1883 event for, for about a year, so we were prepared to, to respond very, very rapidly. And uh, the two events, Krakatoa and a Krakatoa related, we don't quite understand yet why. The Anna Krakatoa uh, uh, volcano has grown in the caldera. We've never experienced this particular tsunami from a volcanic eruption pre previously. And we're still actually working on this now. I'm going out in July 2019 to actually uh, collect more data on 1883 and also on 2018. Lessons learned. Immediately, Indonesia responded and they are now modifying, developing their warning system system but we still have problems we still have problems with eruption uh, triggered uh, tsunamis globally it's significant because there are over 40 more than 40 volcanoes near the sea in the world which are potentially anna krakatoas or perhaps even krakatoa so hopefully in the future uh, the work that we're doing on anna krakatoa will lead not only to better understanding eruption mechanisms perhaps downstream into development of tsunami warning systems from non-seismic sources thank you So good afternoon, and uh, thank you for your interest in this uh, uh, press conference. Uh, the study which I'm going to present is a theoretical study which uses both uh, statistical analysis and physical constraints on the uh, size of the earthquakes in order to estimate the magnitudes and frequencies of the largest earthquakes on Earth. Um, this uh, initial figure that I show, instead of showing something like uh, the destruction of an earthquake, uh, is a view of the Earth from the Moon in order to highlight that this is uh, a global study, but actually that uh, one of the sources of shaking is um, one of the most important sources of shaking on the long term is uh, that of seismic <clears throat> sorry, uh, that of uh, impacts from asteroids and comets, of which we have a lot of uh, record on, on the Moon, particularly. So the key findings of this study are, first, that earthquakes with magnitude 10 or larger are, uh, in principle, possible, but unlikely. They probably occur once every 2,000 years or even more, depending on the statistical model used, on average. Uh, that means that they can cluster in time. They do, do not necessarily happen every 2,000 years. Um, 
From physical constraints on the earthquake size, the maximum possible magnitude of usual tectonic earthquakes on Earth is probably about 10.4, although this is extremely unlikely to reach. Even larger earthquakes generated by the impacts of asteroids or comets are expected, according to these calculations, once every 10 million years or even more on average. So, uh, in order to provide some context, this is uh, the result, well, some of the many images that we can show about the um, earthquakes of magnitude 9 or greater. This in particular is for Japan. So these earthquakes, especially in subduction zones, which are the largest faults on Earth, where a tectonic plate sinks under another, they can cause devastating tsunamis, apart from, from enormous shaking and very long-lasting. Um, so usually, um, tectonic earthquakes of magnitude 10 or larger are not considered possible. Uh, the largest recorded earthquake had a magnitude 9.6 and happened uh, in Chile in 1960. Uh, we have had only five earthquakes of magnitude 9 or greater recorded. So um, this is the context for the tectonic or usual tsunamis. And for example, uh, when people ask, uh, can really mega earthquakes, those of the Hollywood movies, really happen, like magnitude 10 or larger? Um, the typical answer from geologists or physicists is that no. Uh, for example, this is from the United States Geological Survey webpage. No earthquakes of magnitude 10 or larger cannot happen. We don't have uh, big enough faults on Earth to produce them. Um, the context related to the shaking uh, due to impacts is that, well, we know that uh, of all the energy involved in an impact of an asteroid or comet, a small fraction of it is transferred to the ground as uh, seismic waves. Um, an impact like this probably um, trigger shaking similar to magnitude 6, the, one, the, the metro crater in Arizona. Um, the modeling of, and geological evidence of the largest impacts on Earth already suggested shaking magnitudes or, of 10 or greater. So there are paper publishes, papers published by other colleagues uh, dealing with the geological evidence of massive shaking associated, for example, to the Chicxulub uh, impact, the one which is uh, associated as the cause of the extinction of the dinosaurs and many other creatures 66 million years ago. So uh, the calculations that I did considered a number of data sets. Uh, first, the statistics of earthquakes occur since 1904. Uh, we have several thousand large earthquakes recorded, and especially for the last years and decades, we have a, an especially good record. But with these earthquakes, it's not enough for, for really figuring out which is the maximum limit of earthquake size. In order to calculate uh, the maximum possible limit, I have to consider the sizes of subduction zones. These are the largest faults on Earth. Um, and well, the larger the fault, the larger the magnitude of the earthquakes that it can produce. So there is a physical limit on these uh, maximum magnitude derived from the area of the, of the fault, in this case of the subduction zones, from previous models on the subduction zone geometry. And also these calculations consider the, the impact rate of asteroids and comets with Earth. We know that we are uh, in the middle of uh, crisscross of orbits of asteroids and comets. Some of them are coming close enough to pose some significant threat of impact. And other colleagues have calculated the uh, frequency of impacts of different energies with Earth. Well, which are the practical implications of these um, results? In seismic hazard assessments, such large earthquakes, for example, magnitude 10 or larger, are not usually considered. Um, but such events could produce especially large tsunamis and especially strong and lasting shaking, which could affect even distant locations. So uh, in order to calculate seismic hazard, probably we will have to consider very unlikely, very high magnitude earthquakes, which occur far away from our site of interest. 
Well, this study has a number of uncertainties, um, and future research will be needed in order to improve these estimates. Uh, first, we have to uh, do more research on which are the physical and geological limits of earthquake ruptures. This is something which is a long standing problem in earthquake science. Um, also, there are significant uncertainties in the impact rate calculations from orbital modeling. And this is something in which new computational uh, abilities, power, is, is having a big uh, impact, is, is improving the calculations a lot. And also, uh, more observations, ex experiment, uh, experiments and modeling of seismic wave radiation from impacts are needed. So we know approximately which fraction of the energy of impacts is transferred to the ground in terms of, of seismic energy, but this is a very uncertain parameter. So thank you very much for your interest. Can you move here? Okay, thank you very much for coming and it's really nice to see glacial lakes being highlighted in, in this way. What I will be presenting on behalf of my colleagues from Zurich University and also the Tibet Plateau Research Institute from Beijing is the first large-scale assessment of glacial lake outburst flood danger for all of Tibet. Three uh, key aspects that make this study exciting I want to highlight here, as I alluded to, this is really the first comprehensive study that's been done for this entire region. I mean it's a really large scale study. On the right you see the type of situation that we're looking at. So this is a typical glacial lake. The main threat to this lake is from the steep ice front you see behind the lake. This ice falls in into the lake creates a wave which then overtops the, the dam structure here and travels downstream. This lake in fact caused an outburst in 2005. You can see that here from this cut that's in the dam structure here. So these are the kind of lakes that we're interested in. We've come up with an automated way to look at these lakes right across the Tibet. So we have something like 1,900 uh, like 1, glacial lakes which we do this assessment for. This provides really important information for local policymakers. They can then identify what the most dangerous lakes are and plan their risk, risk, uh, risk management or risk yeah, like mitigation strategies. So things like early warning systems, uh, defense structures that could make these uh, lakes more stable. At, at the moment or prior to the study, they didn't have that information telling them where they should focus, focus their funding and their efforts. One of the key aspects of this study is that we identify some important situations where we have glacial lakes that have developed in China, but most of the threat is actually downstream in ne ne Nepal, so across the border. We call these transboundary threats. So these are important, obviously, because these are much more complex to try and, to try and, uh, and manage this risk, because you have to coordinate between two countries. So just a little bit more, highlighting what we did in this study, we look at both the likelihood of an outburst flood and the potential consequences for downstream communities. So the likelihood and the magnitude of the flood, we call this the GLOF, GLOF hazard. Most studies take on board this aspect. There's plenty of studies that consider this. What is new? especially at this scale, is to also consider the downstream population. So this is the exposure, the people that could be affected by this outburst flood. And when we have exposed communities and a large potential magnitude and likelihood, then we have what we call GLOF danger or lake outburst flood danger. Just two, two examples there from India. This was in 2013. You see the extent of the damage that can be done to these exposed communities. In this case, there were several hundred people killed in this village, but actually more, more than several thousand downstream as this thing moved, moved down the valley. So 
Just to highlight some of the results from the study, when we look at the hazards, so we look at lakes that are potentially unstable, these are widespread across Tibet, but a lot of these lakes are in remote regions, so they're too far away to actually affect people. So just switching between hazard and then what we call danger, so we take into a board the communities that could be impacted, we see only 210 out of these nearly 2,000 lakes could potentially threaten human settlements. So this is already useful information for the policy makers. They can then focus on these lakes. We call these hotspots of, of risk. And as I mentioned, one of the key hotspots here is this transboundary region in the central Himalayan where these uh, counties of Tibet, lakes there that could produce an outburst flood, they would travel downstream and across the border and cause chaos there. So just to zoom in on one of these transboundary regions and two particular lakes that we're interested in. The lake you see here, this, this has been known before, there's been studies on this lake because it's caused three major disasters in the past hundred years. Most recently in 1981, 200 people were killed. All of these deaths, or the vast majority of these deaths, were across the border in ne Nepal. So you see here, the red dots are where we've identified communities would be affected from an outburst from this lake. Interesting, this lake from our study comes out as the most dangerous lake, so just giving us confidence in our method that we're able to identify these critical situations. The second lake here, this is called the Galonso. This is where we are focusing our field studies. This lake has not been really studied well before. From our assessment, it comes out as the second most dangerous lake across Tibet. And in fact, this lake is up to 10 times larger than this lake that killed 200 people in 1981. So this is clearly a lake where we need to do more studies. And we've been there in September last year trying to measure the, the volume of this lake because that's an important additional information you need to know before you get into early warning systems, these kind of things. So just to conclude, some other aspects of this study, it was really one of the first uh, novel associations between Chinese and Swiss-based uh, scientists. We have a lot of expertise in Switzerland because people there have been living with these kind of events for many years, so it was an interesting case to transfer this knowledge from the Alps to Tibet. Just to highlight what we have here is like a snapshot of the current risk, but this environment is changing really quickly as a result of global warming. So these type of studies have to be repeated at perhaps every five years or 10 years because these lakes are growing really quickly and new lakes are forming. And finally, we would like to see this study replicated or we would like to replicate the study now across other parts of high mountain Asia, countries like India or Pakistan because there's a lot of dollars, a lot of money going into funding GLOF projects in these regions, but the starting point should be this kind of study that points to where that money should be targeted so that we're not potentially wasting money on the wrong regions or, or lakes. And with that, I, I will conclude. Thank you very much for your presentations. We'll now open the floor for questions. Are there any questions from the journalists in the room? Uh, that you're showing uh, with um, your presentation here. What, what did you learn from that simulation? From the simulation of the tsunami? Yeah. Right. From the simulation of the tsunami? Uh, yeah, um, there's uh, with tsunamis, there's a source mechanism, uh, and uh, uh, if you're fortunate enough uh, to validate any numerical model, that you make. It's good if you have, in this case, uh, information on the elevation of the tsunami on the impacted coastline. I always say to people, you can model anything, but if the model is real, then you have to have validation. Uh, and my colleague, Stefan Grilly, who's been leading the numerical modeling, has uh, used the landslide, it's about 0.5 of a cubic kilometer, a little bit smaller. Uh, to generate the tsunami from, from the eruption, and he's validated the results from on-land surveys, which uh, took place after the tsunami struck, 
Uh, the elevation of tsunami is up to about 13 meters, generally about five or six meters, and the uh, and the simulation is pretty much validated by the observations taken from uh, the on-land uh, tsunami surveys, but also from reporting from individual people who are actually impacted by the tsunami. Yeah, yes, I think so, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to hock things here. Um, Simon, how, how did you assess uh, the hazard? I mean, did you visit them? Uh, is this uh, satellites looking uh, at the, you know, the area of the lakes and whether they're growing at all? How do you get to the assessment mm -hmm. of um, the hazard and of the explosion? What's the, the steps that will be around the If it's okay, I actually have a slide. I can just, is that okay if I flip to? Yeah. So for the hazard, so this is all based on satellite data. That's the first point. For that, this kind of scale, you, you can't visit yeah. 1,200 lakes. I mean, it's just not possible. So for the hazard, we have these four factors. So one is the size of the lake. Obviously, that's important for the magnitude. We consider the size of the watershed, so the blue line there surrounding the lake, because that determines how much runoff from snowmelt and rainfall could come into that lake. That's another factor which causes these events. We consider the slope of the area downstream of the lake, because that's, again, a key factor. And most importantly, we know from historical events that most outburst events in this region are caused by ice avalanches going in and causing this outburst event. So we calculate the potential for ice avalanches to occur in that watershed area, considering steep slopes greater than 30 degrees, and also how far uh, something from that slope would have to travel to reach the lake. So these areas in red here, obviously are closer to the lake, there's more potential for something to enter that lake. In that case, it would be a debris slide rather than an ice fall. So these factors together give us the hazard for that lake. Exposure is more simple. We take advantage here of OpenStreetMap. This is this crowdsourcing uh, strategy to map all the buildings across Tibet. These are these polygons you see here. So we model the potential uh, outburst path for every single lake and then identify the buildings that are located in that path. And again, considering how far downstream these buildings are from the lake, they get a higher or lower exposure rating. So it's considering the buildings and how far downstream they are from the lake. From your study, uh, have you identified um, lakes that particularly need intervention now? that the Nepalese or the Chinese government should go and do so, whether to bleed the lakes or, or whatever, because of the threat that, that you have discovered in, in your study? We're always cautious from a remote sensing study to go to that level. What we always say is, so we can identify lakes where field studies must now take place. And then based on what they, what they observe in the field, then you would go to that next stage of actually potentially bleeding a lake. But we would never say, based on a remote sensing approach, you now have to interfere and intervene with that lake. Because there's been examples where, I mean, there are side effects of doing those kind of things, of course. So this study is what we call a first order study. From this, you would now go to the field and do local investigations. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Hi, Patrick Gailey, AFP. Um, David, you mentioned that there are 40 volcanoes around the world um, in the vicinity of water that could be potential Krakatoas. Do we have any idea how many people live within a sort of risk area or one of those to go in total? And perhaps I could extend that question, morbid as it may be, to the other panellists. Um, Alvaro, uh, magnitude 10, where it's most likely to take place, how many people would be at risk? Mm -hmm. And Simon... How many people uh, are at risk of the hazards you describe in your study? It's a, it's a good question. 
And I think one of the, uh, the downstream aspects of events like Anna Krakatoa is suddenly we're aware of a hazard which is hovering in the background. And we haven't, I don't think any, I've, I've got a colleague in the audience, I don't know, if Sam doesn't know anything either. Um, but there are millions of people who do, do live adjacent to volcanoes. I think it's about two or three million. Uh, uh, but I don't think anyone's actually looked at the, at the the particular hazard that those people have, except from eruptions. So I think uh, one of the ramifications of Anna Krakatoa is it's like Indian Ocean, uh, Papua New Guinea, Japan. Suddenly we're aware of this, and hopefully we will be able to do something about it. People, once we've actually better understood the mechanism, there's, we're still working on that. We know it's an eruption. We know it's a landslide. Um, then hopefully downstream, then groups of people would begin to say, hey, is this a real hazard? How serious it is? And what do we do to mitigate it? Well, regarding magnitude 10 earthquakes, there are only very few people who have actually tried to simulate something like that. Um, for that, you will need what is called dynamic rupture simulations, in which uh, it's not just a statistical study with some physical constraints like the one I did, but you actually need a numerical simulation of how the rupture of the earthquake propagates in the subduction interface and, and move the, and produces displacement in one block or another. And also uh, for you know, tsunami simulations, numerical tsunami simulations. For the really, really large earthquakes due to impacts, um, these 10.5 or larger earthquakes, those are global events. So. Um, for example, the available numerical simulations for the Chicxulub impact shows, show that um, there are several meters of amplitude of ground motion worldwide and especially near the impact and on the antipodes because the Earth acts as a lens. So these seismic waves go concentrated again uh, on the opposite side of the Earth. And, uh, for example, in that case, um, it's also related to global a peak of global volcanism. Uh, so there is uh, increased um, volcanic activity after the impact and so on. So these are really recent results which are backed by both the numerical simulations and geological evidence. Well, I need to be clear that, I mean, we're talking about high mountain regions here, so of course we don't have the level of population exposed that you would have, for example, earthquakes or tsunamis. But we know, I mean, these communities are densely populated, so worst case, large outburst floods, you're talking thousands at risk. And we've seen for India where there were 6,000 killed from one of these events. But it's clearly not the same scale as megacities. Let me add one remark. Uh, of course, if such a big impact happens, the seismic shaking is only a minor problem. So there are many other problems to worry about, but uh, like, you know, uh, atmospheric blocking, um, ejecta fallout, uh, darkness, which kills the plants and so on and so forth. But shaking is, is also a global effect of these big impacts. Thank you very much. Are there any additional questions from the journalists in the room? If not, we'll finish here. You are welcome to approach our speakers and book one of the interview rooms we have available. And I should also mention that there are a couple of press releases associated with this press conference available at media.egu.eu slash documents, which are in the press kits. But if you didn't get them, you can go online. And uh, thank you all for your talks. Thank you all very much for coming. And I hope to see you tomorrow at the 9 a.m. press conference on Marks of the Anthropocene. Thank you. Thank you.